Property Patriot, you are cleared hot. Good day, High Flyers, and welcome to the AMI Podcast. I am your host, Bud Evans, the Property Patriot. Today, I'm joined by Margaret Kozlock. Margaret is partners with Christine Shu and Nobly Best. Hear how Margaret started out with Sotheby's and moved herself into this new company, where we provide real estate investors the tools to create generational wealth. This is the AMI Podcast, show number 33. Greetings, High Flyers, and welcome to the Aim High podcast. Today, I'm joined by Margaret Kozlark. How are you today, Margaret? I'm doing great. Doing great. Thank you for being on. I know you are partners with Christine Shu, and that is actually how we met through LinkedIn. I know a little bit about you, but would you be so kind as to give me a quick introduction? Absolutely. I like to tell everybody I did everything I was supposed to do. I went to college, I got a business degree, got that corporate job, worked really hard to the quarter office and got there and was miserable and thought there has to be a better way. And I had little all that stuff. So I started investing passively in real estate in 2016, quit my W2 in 2019, and now I am a full-time investor and I am also a realtor as well. Excellent. And now what do you primarily invest in? syndications, mainly multifamilies, although I have done some short-term rentals. Those are the asset classes I would say I'm the most comfortable with. I'm not adverse to others. I just need to find the time to do my homework. Sure. And it meets, it meets everything that you want and you're good with that level of risk, which is actually a lot lower than it is with investing in single family properties. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So how exactly did you get into real estate? First off, let's start with, you work for Sotheby's? I do. That is cool. Thank you. And it's really funny you mentioned Sotheby's because I actually recently joined them. I was at another broker before that. But one of my sort of passion projects is to get more real estate agents investing in real estate because it's stunning to me that only maybe less than 10% actually walk the talk and do their own investment properties. And if they do, bud, it's more like they have a rental Maybe they have a couple of single family homes, but they don't even know about syndication. So I love helping and helping them grow their wealth. Yeah. I find it amazing when I went through, I I am licensed in New Jersey. I'm dragging my feet on the Pennsylvania license. But when I went through my courses, it was basically just open game on flippers and wholesalers and how evil they were. And it, it I just found it funny because here I was sitting in that class already having gone through about five or six flips at the time and going out, I'm not a bad person. I just really (laughs) like doing this stuff. It's funny too. So wholesalers, we all know, get a bad rap and there's good and bad in every industry. Certainly the thing I find interesting is when COVID happened and I'm sure I'm in Connecticut, I know you're in Jersey. It was probably similar for you. It was like lighter fluid hit the market, Mm -hmm. just exploded. People were streaming out of New York City. And so I actually picked up a lot of my investor clients who couldn't get these things for super low rates. And I said to them, you need to invest in syndication. So a lot of them finally came over to syndication. They're still doing some active stuff too. Some people just like to get their hands on a hammer and nail, but, uh, but a lot of them moved over and did some passive investing too. Yeah. And there's this kind of unwritten rule that I completely disagree with. But, you know, when people are just starting out in the real estate industry, it's, oh, you got to wholesale so that you can learn how to flip. And then you got to flip to learn how to buy single family homes. And then you buy single family homes to learn how to get into residential multifamily and residential multifamily gets you into multi commercial multifamily. And then you can go industrial. And I just went, what? And now 30 what? years have gone by. Exactly. And now you, and now you're getting ready to retire and you don't want to do the rest. Right. Or, yeah, you're exactly. so burned out after year five. Yeah, hello, I was. Right. Pick pick your niche. You you did it, right? You started out and you went, I I'm never going right to syndication. A family owner. That's exactly right. I went directly to syndication. So I was, I had a good corporate job. I was making decent money, but like I said, I wasn't happy. I was exhausted. I wasn't seeing my kids and I had no time to even think about being a landlord and deal with tenants and anything like that. And so I was lucky because a colleague of mine was working with syndication and she said, I'm buying these apartment buildings. You should you should invest. And at first I started laughing. So I can't afford an apartment building. What are you crazy? But then I realized it was really just a piece of apartment building and it was just everybody pooling their money together. And yes, so that's what I did with my first one back in 2016. And in two and a half years, I invested $50,000 from my 401k, by the way, that was another thing. You don't even have to have 
pile of money. So I invested 50,000 in my 401k. And two years later, that 50 had grown to 78. And then I took that money and rolled it into another one and then just kept going. So it's, I'm like, this is amazing. I love this. Yeah. And that there are so many different things, so many different aspects of return that you get from something that large. And I know that the, the depreciation has been quelled where they went from 100% cost segregation and taking all of your depreciation up front to now it's 80%. And it's going to go down every year for the next five years till it goes to zero. But it's the bonus depreciation. You still, bonus you still depreciation. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Do me a favor. Let's go through. I know that we can't really touch on your first deal that much because it was a, a 506B, which is for primarily non-accredited investors and we're not allowed to advertise and that's great. But yeah, right. let's go th through some basics, like how you found your first deal. Sure. Absolutely. So I'll speak from the LP side and then I can speak from the GP side. As I mentioned, this first deal got introduced to me. And, and when my colleague had mentioned it, by the way, I didn't jump in right away because I really had to work on that mindset because I just, for whatever reason, everybody hears, you think investing, you think stocks, stock market, stocks and bonds, and mutual funds, and nobody really talks about this. So I had to go get it, right? But I watched what she did and I did some research and I learned and I'm like, okay, I get this. I'm a numbers person. So it made sense. So I got that great return from the first one. And then I was doing that for about three years, investing in a bunch of different properties as an LP with my 401k which means I couldn't benefit from that depreciation that you just brought up until I invested post-tax dollars. So a few years later, my mom passed away. She left me with a little bit of money, not a ton. I invested like $25,000 in, in a project. And then same thing. Not only did I make a great return, but I also, I had those passive gains, but then they were offset by the losses. So I didn't end up, I don't want to say I didn't pay taxes. I deferred the taxes and it just kept rolling it along the lines. And the amazing thing is, this is also why I'm so passionate about real estate agents. If you are a real estate professional, you can take any additional depreciation and offset your personal income, Yes, which is amazing. So many agents are leaving all this money on the table that they don't even know about. But anyway, that's my little side passion project. But anyway, so I was doing this for about three years and then family and friends were, what is this you're doing? You're buying apartments? You're, okay. How can I do this? How can I get involved? So I was referring them to folks. And then I'm like, I don't need to just send all these people out. I can have my own company. So I formed a very small firm and I did that for a little bit. And then Christine and I met and Nobly Vest was born about two years ago. And so since then, we've done about five different projects together as either co-GPs or fund of funds, which we can certainly talk about. But those were amazing as well. And to answer your question about how, how you got started or how I met people, it's a team sport, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing. You can be an individual investor and buy that single family home and fix and flip it and nobody else has to be involved. There is no way one person could possibly do a syndication, especially because it's usually, at least if you're where I am, which is in the Northeast, it's mm -hmm. not even in your backyard. It's usually in Texas or Florida or some other very landlord-friendly state where the population is going, the jobs are going. So you have to make sure you have good partners. On the yeah. Now let's talk about the difference between limited partnerships. Limited partnerships, sure. can you do me a favor and just quickly go over that? I know it's simplistic, but. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Basically, if you think about it, this is the best analogy we give you is so think about like an airplane ride. So the limited partners are the passengers, right? So they invest the money in the sense that they buy their ticket, but then they're just sitting back enjoying the free beverages, meals, whatever the perks of the flight are, but they don't have to do any of the work. And then the general partners are the pilots and the flight attendants. They are, they are making sure they get there on time, that they're hitting all their specs in the cockpits. They're making sure they're communicating with the limited partners. So they're doing the heavy lifting and the work and the limited partners are just along for the ride. Yeah. And that's a great analogy. See, I'm yeah. one of the guys who throws the luggage into the plane. So there I'm you go. You're a general partner. raise cash. So that's my <laughs> plane. I'm I'm the guy who fills up the plane with the gas and the luggage so that the plane. Yeah, is exactly. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah. I can't take credit for it, but it, because it's been around for a while, but it's the best way I think to help people wrap their head around it. Oh, but one other thing I will also mention, bud, is so limited partners also have no liability, right? Like they don't have to worry if something goes wrong in the cockpit or if you run out of peanuts or whatever. The general partners are the ones taking on more risk as well. That's a piece. 
Great. Have you ever run into a sticking point or has anything ever gone wrong either at the limited partner or the general partnership side? So the limited partner, I don't think so. I've been pretty fortunate. Some properties do better than others, obviously. Before you invest, there'll be a webinar. There's usually an offering summary so you can read through everything. Um, and we can talk in a minute about what people look for when they invest. On the general partner side, one of the first projects I did, and I always tell people, so you have to plan for the unexpected. You may not even know what it is, but have some plan. So we bought a property in Texas outside of Dallas, 111 units. We bought it in the fall of 2019. Six months later, March of 2020, we all know what happens. COVID comes, the world literally shuts down, literally shuts down. So, okay, now we have people like, okay, first of all, are the tenants going to be able to pay their rent? We can't have the leasing office open. So that's one issue. Can't even necessarily for a while have contractors in there working on the value add plan. So that was a piece. So that was one. Then it was Texas. So Texas eased some of their restrictions a little earlier. So that was helpful. Then there was a freak ice storm, right? So then some pipes burst and there was some water. Then there was a, one of those weird micro tornado things and we got some roof damage. So then that happened, right? So all of this crazy stuff happened. And in fact, what we did was we actually paused distributions for a while just because we weren't hurting, but we wanted to save that cash until we got the insurance reimbursement. Communicated the whole time, by the way, with our investors, what was going on. They're watching the news. They're, I didn't want them calling me saying, what's up with the ice storm? I wanted to get in front of it. But then what ended up happening is we ended up selling that property after two and a half years. We were originally intending to hold it for five. So we sold it for two and a half and everybody still made 31% on their money. So it was a little lower than we had planned because again, we shortened the length, but people making 30% return during a pandemic were thrilled, thrilled. And I think the reason for that is because no matter what it is, you always have to have that buffer, right? You have to, everybody says it, but you have to really be conservative with your underwriting. Because I always say, I don't care how good you are. No one had global pandemic as a line item. Nobody had that. So we didn't have that either, but we had enough like padding and just kind of safety nets that we were able to absorb some temporary cash flow issues while we were waiting for insurance reimbursement and everybody made money and rolled. Most of them came right over on with me to the next deal. Conservative underwriting saves you every time. Yeah. You almost have to expect something's going to go wrong or maybe sideways is a better way to put it. Something I mean, you should just have a Murphy line. Just Yeah, exactly. I love that Murphy actually. I love that. Line item. Shit. I'm going to use that one. There you go. Yeah. So what do you currently have going on? I know Nobly Vest is big. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, so Christine and I have done Nobly Vest. We have, let's see, we've got, I should know this number. I want to say it's 1,400 units so far. We've totally worked with, and this is across all the deals. We've got a, a five property portfolio in Dothan. We've got, I think it's about 300 units in Sarasota, Florida. Just closed as a fund of fun with Rise 48 on a project called Desert Cove in Phoenix. And then we have, then we did a couple of fund of funds, one with a short-term rental fund, which has 80 properties in it, and another with a really large three-property multifamily, which I think was like 160. So some we've been on the partnership team, other we've come in as fund of funds, but either way, it's been a great learning experience. And now we're looking at doing a debt fund because a lot of our investors are really skittish about the economy and they want a place to park their money, but they want that liquidity if they need to take it out. So we're working on a debt fund with a 90 day. Excellent. Now the debt fund, are we talking about lending? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Essentially lending to established fix and flippers, essentially. Yeah. Outstanding. That's great. That, um, yeah, I saw a hierarchy of real estate investor meme one time where the Chimpanzee was the wholesaler and the <laughs> pro magnet in a suit pulling a wagon full of cash was the lender. Yeah, this will be our first round and we're partnering with another operator on this. So we're, again, we're coming, this is one where we're coming in as a fund of funds. So we won't be doing the operating, but we'll have our own little entity that's coming in and investing. Excellent. Good for you. So now beyond that, is there anything else on the horizon? I know you guys started this two years ago and you've been growing pretty well. 
We really have. And we had a lot of projects that we actually turned down because it's really important for us that we have controlled growth. Mm -hmm. And especially because of everything that's going on with the economy, it's very tempting where when people say, hey, do you want to partner with us on? Right. But you have to stop and look at the underwriting. And so Christine and I are both fairly analytical. So we'll look through it. And even if we're on the fence, we'll hire an outside underwriter at our, mm -hmm. out of our own pocket just to get an objective viewpoint, somebody with no skin in the game, just to let us know what they think. And what I like about that is when people think about underwriting, they tend to think about underwriting the deal, right? Does it make money? Tell me, is it a class B or C? What part of location it is? We go a little bit broader. So of course we do that. Then we look at the neighborhood, what part of town, the town itself, the state, any kind of municipalities. We mentioned our people moving there, our jobs moving there. And more importantly, is there job diversification? Because if the whole area is dependent on one employer, that's a risk I wouldn't be comfortable because if they ever folded, that whole economy would collapse. So, so I've said that to every military base. Yes, that's why that I would never do that. Every, everywhere. I can't do North Street that. from McGuire. And I just, I, they're like, Browns Mills, Browns Mills. Great. What happens if McGuire gets bracked? Base right. realignment and closure happens every once in a while. Not that it will. They just made it a super base. But it could. Everything, but it could. Yeah, I've seen it before. Yeah. That diversification is key. And the, uh, as far as the diversity of jobs, having that anchor there is great. But what else do you have in the area, right? That's exactly right. So a lot of times if there's a university, if there's hospitals, because we do end up being like in Texas and the Carolina, a lot of times you'll have Amazon warehouses or different right. warehouses. So you just need a bunch of different things to make sure that, like you said, if any one of them leaves, the economy is not going to be, it'll take a hit, but it'll survive. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Now I've got to ask you, Margaret, we're getting ready to go into the soaring four, but before that, the last question that I have for you during this conversation, all right, what is one thing that you learned as your wealth increased? Again, I would say that it's a team. So you mm -hmm. can't do everything. And that's really important for any of your listeners who are maybe fix and flippers looking to grow. It's really hard because I think we all know, we all trust ourselves and nobody can do it better than I, but it's like that book, Who Not How. You definitely yeah. have to learn how to delegate. Have trusted partners, certainly vet them, but you're going to have to ease up a little bit. And, and if you really want to grow, you're going to have to bring somebody on. And that could be anywhere from a VA to part-time CFO, whatever it might be, depending on where your growth is. So I think I would say that, which is that it's a team sport and you got to choose your partners. Here. Excellent point. Okay. Margaret, we're about to go into the soaring four. These are the same four questions that I ask every guest in order to help someone who is just starting out achieve new heights. Are you ready? Sure. Let's do it. All right. Great. What is one thing that you use to keep yourself motivated? I listen to a lot of podcasts and I listen to a lot of like when I'm driving, just a lot of mindset kind of videos and audio tapes just to keep me focused on my goals, but also really keep me focused on that law of attraction, right? That positive mindset. It's really important. And I always, obviously I'm high energy and I always thought I was a really positive person. But a few years ago, I realized that I actually was a little bit of a negative Nelly and I didn't even know it. So don't say, for example... I don't want to be late. Just say, I want to be on time. Focus always on what you want, not what you don't want. Great. What is one thing, if you can put a finger on it, what is one thing that you learned that completely changed your mindset? Just that people like me could actually be in syndication, that we could be part owners of a 300 unit apartment complex. I think that was just, I had, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. And it was mind boggling. And I've met so many people who feel the same way. They're very high income earners and they're like, how did I, how have I never heard of this? You know? Yeah. Was there one thing specifically that got you to go from, oh, I could never invest in something that big to, oh my goodness, I'm going to do, I'm going to buy a 270 unit in El Paso, Texas. So it was the first deal was definitely daunting as with anything. And once you do that first one, it's okay. But I think for me, because I was investing with a self-directed IRA, which mm -hmm. by the way, is how I converted my 401k so I could invest. I figured I'm not going to use this money for a while anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It would be awful to lose 50 grand, but I can afford to take this because I can't use this money right now anyway. So let me just give it a shot and see what happens. And the irony of course, is that by investing 
with pre-tax dollars, I didn't even get all of the benefits from post-tax dollars, but I still did well, which is why I kept going. Okay, great. What tools do you use to keep yourself on track? Lots of tools. So we have, we have a ton of various spreadsheets, as you can imagine. We use Active Campaign a lot. I would say that's one of the biggest ones. We use that to communicate with our investors because you had asked what's on that, what's coming up for us next. And because we're taking a pause, we're really making sure that we're still staying in touch and we do educational monthly webinars, that sort of thing. And so Active Campaign, I would say, is a great tool to manage all that. Great. And then lastly, if you had to start all over again, what is one thing you would change? I would have started so much earlier. I'm sure everybody says this. Oh my gosh, I would have started so much earlier. I don't even know if I would have gone to college. I probably would have gone to college because I did get really good business skills from that. But I probably would have started right out of college. And I, you would probably be talking to me from some island in Fiji now. Oh. Nice. Yeah. Oh, house yeah. hacking. I wish I would have known back then what I know now. House hacking is great. I, I didn't even know that was a thing and it makes so much sense. But yeah, I love that. Margaret, I really do appreciate your time. I know this was quick, relatively speaking. I guess it was quick. Most of these podcasts yeah. are like 35, 40 minutes in length, but we try to keep it quick. But I really do appreciate it again. Thank you very much for coming on. Is there anything that you have going on that you'd like to put out there right now? Sure. And I guess the only thing else I would say too is yeah, feel free, anybody, if they'd like to just have a conversation and to reach out. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. A lot of people were there giving free advice when I was coming up. And so we always yeah. like to return the favor. Yeah. And that is actually the last question of the day is, <laughs> Margaret, if someone wanted to reach out to you, how would they go ahead and do that? There you go. So it's noblyvest.com, N-O-B-L-I-V-E-S-T. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. We also have a great Instagram page where we do a bunch of blogs. There's just a lot of info we put out. And hopefully by the time this comes out, our website relaunched will be done. We're in the middle of completely redoing our website. And so we have a lot of free data on our website as well. Perfect. Again, once again, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, until the next time we meet, aim high.